Tonight, actor Peter Callahan and I talk Red Green, Ranger Gore, the secret sauce behind the newsroom, the ugly truth about Americans and Canadians, and the true Hollywood story of what really happened to Lloyd Braun. It's up all night with Bob. Stay, like, subscribe. It's fun. Come on, hang out. Don't go anywhere. Folks, my guest tonight is quite frankly one of my favorite actors in the whole live long world. Uh, not only has he recurred on just about every iconic Canadian television series you can think of, including Made in Canada, The Newsroom, Murdoch Mysteries, Royal Canadian Air Force, Slings and Arrows, Billable Hours, Working Moms, Saving Hope. He also has an impressive list of credits south of the border, including a most memorable turn as the original, and in my mind only, Lloyd Braun on Seinfeld. Ladies and gentlemen, here he is, The Rock. Mr. Reliable, Mr. Money in the Bank, Peter Callahan. How are you, sir? I'm well. Thanks for that info, Rob. I'm not making that up. I you I always I do. I think of you as money in the bank. Anytime I've been on something and Peter Callahan's coming in, you know you got something that well and, and and the favorite actor in the world bit. I mean, geez, uh I'll pay you back for that one somehow. Yeah. Well, one of. I mean, I, I you're, it's a category. But it's a small category. Um before we, uh, uh, just before we get into anything else, I want to inquire after your uh, your uh, famous father-in-law, Mr. Gordon Pinsent, Canadian icon, legend, national treasure. Uh, how is he doing? He's doing okay. You know, he's he's 92 years old now, and he, he still has a wicked sense of humor. He makes me laugh so hard. I took him I took him out for a haircut a couple of weeks ago, and uh, uh, after the haircut, he got into the car, and uh, I said, so listen, uh, uh, how about lunch? What do, you, what do you feel like eating? And he paused for just a second, and he said, Ava Gardner. <laughs> <laughs> we'll pass a movie set on, uh, in Toronto. You know, there's tons of movie sets around the streets, and, it, and I said, uh, oh, just look at that, Gord. That's another movie we're not in. And they said, yeah. I hope they know they're not going to make any money off it. <laughs> <laughs> I love Ava Gardner. I love that most of the time I find that people whose frame of reference kind of lines up with my own tend to be at least 60 and over. And in this case, 92. But, but yeah. I discovered during my uh, deep uh, research on you in the, in the Wikipedia, you and I graduated from the same alma mater. You went to York University. Well, yeah, I didn't. Gra well, I did graduate. I, um, I, I went to um, I, I went to a whole bunch of theater schools before I ended up at York, and um, it was it was it was really just busy work for me because you know uh, my father you know is was a, a, a an immigrant a, a Polish immigrant and when I said I wanted to become an actor he just sort of threw his hands up and said I have no idea what to do for you Peter get get an education it's probably a very good idea. So that's all I did was was go to school for theater and and you know at the end of all of these years of theater school in England and Canada, I found myself having to forget so much of the stuff that I that I learned because you know I came back from Lambda with a Mid Atlantic accent which did not work here you know like Lloyd Lloyd Bachner that sort of attitude that the Canadian television had in the sixties you know which was was it wasn't quite British and it wasn't quite American. It was just somewhere in the mid-Atlantic. And then in 83, I did the Shaw Festival. And then 84, I want to say, or 84, 85, I joined Second City. I did the the touring company for a couple of years. After Second City, I met uh, Steve Smith. Yeah. And we did a show called The Comedy Mill. That was a series we did for three, four years, maybe. Uh, shot out in Hamilton. And as he says, give me enough money to make a TV show, but not enough to tell me what to do. Yeah, and they did, and uh, we had the grandest time just in Hamilton every day, shooting sketch comedy, and in was essentially the comedy mill was it was a factory, and our job was to create comedy, and we'd sit around a table and we talk about a sketch, and then we'd do the sketch, and we did songs, and um, I uh, had a great time. Had, had a, of, it was one of the one of the most fun times I had doing a series that in my life actually. Nobody. I've never, and this to, to this day, and I've been down here for quite some time and worked on a, on a few shows. Um, I've never met anybody who knew his audience and his show better than him. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely, absolutely. And and to credit him, that that to me is just is pure savvy, you know, and 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 his entrepreneurship. Because when when the Red Green Show started to happen, it was it was a it was very small fry, you know. I mean, Ranger Gord's first tower was a kids 
uh, a tree fort in Hamilton that just about <laughs> came down underneath us. Uh, the budget. This was, was a location. So low. Oh yeah, yeah. No, it, it before before we got to a bigger tower, Ranger Gore's fire tower was a kid's treehouse. Uh, <laughs> well, please uh, excuse the mess. I've been changing things around a yeah, little. Yeah, I've changed a bit. You know here. what they say: yeah. a change is as good as a vacation. Yeah. And I haven't had a vacation in thirteen years, and I figured, why not have a change? <laughs> Gosh, thirteen years without a vacation. Yes. Boy, well, that's something. Huh? There's a word. There's a word for that, isn't it? What, what yeah. is that? Uh, uh, Dedication. Uh, sure. Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dedication and uh, loneliness. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, if you look at some of the early ones, and and it swayed, it swayed a great deal. Uh, but when when the show started to happen, uh, and 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 started to get a little bit of traction, he decided that PBS would be a great fit for it, and and uh, he knew that there were affiliates all over the states. And he knew the affiliates would pay only a certain amount of money for a series. But he got in his car with all of these tapes and drove from affiliate to affiliate across the country and said, I am willing to give you this series for X amount of money, which they said, oh, sure. Yeah. Right. Half hour TV show for that. Great. But he got 50, 75 affiliates and it, and it filled his coffers and we got the show got bigger and bigger and the CBC jumped on it and, and made it a, a permanent fixture there. And I think he ran 17 seasons or something at the end of the I day. think it was 15 total, at least of, of Red Green. And obviously, you know, he was doing Red Green on the comedy mill and stuff. But yeah, by the time I got, I didn't get there until 2001. So the show was already an institution by that point. We were at... Um, yeah. Yeah, we were on uh, at on, in the big CBC building, and and by that point, Ranger Gord had his own uh, little uh, corner of the studio with the That's with that, the tree yeah. tower in it. But I loved writing Ranger Gord because you know there was mo all of the segments had a fairly tight structure to them. You know, there was this there was the experts bit on the couch, and there was a thing, and he would do the midlife, and there was the word game. But Gord was like the one place you could kind of go nuts a little bit and he'd let you, do you know what I mean? Like yeah. there yeah. were one of my favorite things that I ever wrote on the show was a, was one of Ranger Gord's cartoons because the, 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 we started doing these animated bits and there was a great young kid who did these animations and I wish I could remember the name of the kid who, who did the yeah, animation. Yeah, a guy from uh, uh, Sheridan College or uh, uh, was it Sheridan College? That the, the, the I think he was from school? Sheridan. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he, he or still in the middle of it. Yeah, he was knocking out these flash animations, and they were, you know, some of them were 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 really pretty impressive. But one of the favorite things I ever wrote for the show was it was a Ranger Gore cartoon, and it was called I don't know what it was called, but it was about the flying squirrel. And the idea was <laughs> that on Flying Squirrel Day, uh, like Groundhog Day, not unlike Groundhog Day in the spring. Flying Squirrel Day is the day the flying squirrel emerges from his hole to see. I know, I know, to see its shadow. Close, Harold. Uh, the to see ghost, the ghost of matinee, matinee idol, idol uh, Tony, Tony Curtis. Curtis. Sound like a Rob Sheridan like idea yet? And so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for some, for some reason, Harold, who played a beaver in the in the thing, his hair kind of the, the I don't know the the squirrel thinks that Harold Looks is like Tony Curtis. An entire squadron. Destruct them, Red. Do you see any nuts? Nothing back. This is no time for levity, man. Scrounge, scrounge. Take us back to uh, 94, 93 for just a second uh, to the newsroom and, and uh, Ken Finkelman. It was very under the radar at the beginning because it was a very small show. It was, uh, I think we only got picked up for six episodes or something. And, uh, right. uh, but the scripts, the scripts were just bloody genius, and 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 word got around pretty quickly in the acting community that everybody, every, you'd want to be in this show. Okay, now I don't think this is a serious death threat. I think this guy's a crank. The guys who threaten are not the guys that pull the trigger. Am I right? Yes, right. of course. You know, I guess I've been blessed in my broadcast career. I've never, ever had a death threat. I mean, not even an an angry letter. I, I have never consciously offended anyone or have been controversial for the sake of 
of of any controversy. You're okay. absolutely right about that. You know, I mean, you are uh, you know a bland guy. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah, you're bland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, some psycho has my name on a slug. That's not from being bland. Well, I, I didn't mean bland. I didn't mean bland. I, I I'm looking for a word here to describe you. I, I I can't find the word at this moment. But the point is, the guys out there with an AK-47 are not looking at the television sets and getting pissed off because they see some guy who's basically very bland. You know, I mean, I you know. You said bland again. I I didn't mean bland. I did say bland. I, I know I said okay, it, was, it, was a, it was a process of auditioning and, and I knew the very first time I went in there that I was the guy and you know he insisted on certain things like swearing and bits and pieces like this and and, and, a, and a really great producer named Peter Mayboom whom yes who always succeeded in making uh, the CBC think it was their idea that he that he did what he did I, I sometimes wonder if there aren't a lot of very talented sort of you know Ken Finkelman type people out there but if you don't find your Peter Mayboom, <laughs> you don't necessarily get to where you want to be. I mean, that yeah. that piece of the puzzle, and I've worked with Peter, you know, yeah, otherwise you're just, well, you're difficult and that's it and you're done, you know. You you really need yeah. that person to sort of be the masseuse between the two. Well, part, part of the problem is that in the past there was always this huge bureaucracy around so much network television. And uh, slowly, not not quickly enough, that you know people are starting to realize that auteur-driven things, David Chase, Ken Fableman, Larry David, you know the list goes on and on. The auteurs. That that it's the way to do it. It's you know, even though somebody in the back of the room might have a different idea, it's not going to be any good. It's not going to be better than the, than what the person that you've given the paintbrush to to say make this painting. Yeah. And shut up about what colors you want. Because yeah. You just told me to do it. Well. I I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've quoted the, the line you quoted off the top of this, which was Steve, because Steve would Steve, Steve would say this during the warm up every week uh, to the audience. Yeah, go into the go into the, the whoever it was CHCH probably at the time and saying, you know, give me enough money to make something, but not nothing you care what it is. And I thought yeah. if we were making and, more and television do, like yeah. that, more good things would be made. There may be more failures, but I always felt like, geez, give everybody a buck and a quarter to make six and maybe only half of these are going to be any good but you'll get something unexpected or different or that you mightn't have had before it's a little bit like the landscape now that that you know there are webisodes and you know they, they do tip their toes in the water and if you wanted to do a webisode i did a, a really great thing uh, a couple of years ago called uh, my kitchen can be anything with um uh oh uh, pat pat thornton pat thornton and uh, it, it was the quirkiest, little weirdest thing, and uh, it was so much fun to do. And and uh, it just about got picked up by CBC. But but Fab Filippo did um, something similar uh, with a couple of his shows, and and they got picked up by the CBC. Pat Thornton, oh, I still I maintain one of the funniest people in the world. Listen, if you ever wanted to sit out the encore, maybe hit the party early. Think about that, Pat. Huh? Why would I want to hit the party? Early? I don't know, maybe you want to help set up? Is the problem that you don't think I can play your songs? Then I can play your songs. I can play some of my own, too. Open the door, step outside, and then close it. All right? You were uh, the original and greatest Lloyd Braun on Seinfeld, a role which still, I mean, this is this is a role in which you probably appear on television sets around the world 35, 40 times a week, right? I mean, it, the show is still constantly being re-aired. Re, re and that one, the non-fat yogurt, featured a, a pre-crazy uh, cameo by uh, Rudy Giuliani. But you played, at the time, Lloyd Braun, George Costanza's childhood nemesis, and he was the campaign manager for uh, D uh, Dinkins, who was, I believe, the incumbent that year. Is that right? Correct. And I was also the campaign manager for Giuliani. We shot both. And so on, I think, I can't remember what day Seinfeld aired, but I think it, I want to say it was a Thursday. I think it was Thursday. Uh, and the election in New York was on a Wednesday. And yes. then whoever won, in this case, it was Giuliani, uh, agreed that on Thursday morning, he would satellite that little bit that they that he does in the show. Yeah. And that my character would be fired because I either had Giuliani laughed off the stage or Dinkins. And in this case, it was ended up being Dinkins. Here's a guy who's been set up as George Costanza's childhood nemesis. He, as soon as you walk in 
in that role, you get it. Because you got the hair, you got you're you're tall, you're good looking, you're great, you got a, you're, you're dressed well, that you're you're confident the way yeah. the way you're talking yeah. to Elaine, you're just you won't you got it all going on, and I just thought that's that guy. And later on, and we'll talk about why they had to recast it. The guy that they got wasn't I didn't think was like that at all. And in fact, they com almost completely changed the character. It became this kind of nebbishy, crazy guy, and I was like. That's because nobody can do uh, Peter Callahan. Nobody can do what Peter Callahan can do. Uh, but tell me about that story. I know it was kind of heartbreaking at the time, and but but yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. I mean, I uh, when I worked in the states, it was under an H one visa, which at the time was a, a visa for actors of a foreign country with extraordinary merit, and you had to prove to bureaucrats that you had. A track record in your country and you had to show them awards and letters of reference etc i've been through so this, that's yeah. what i did and then you would have this h visa for a period of time and i think i can't remember what it was it might have been two years it might have been four years uh and with that visa you could work for anybody you could work you were you were essentially petitioned with the, uh, the, your agent petitioned the ins for you to work down there and you could work for disney you could work for nbc you could work for anybody so uh, I think I shot Seinfeld, what, 95-ish or something, and moved back to Toronto in 95, 96. And it was then that uh, my agent called from the States and said, they want to reprise your character on Seinfeld. And I thought, wow, that is fat. Yeah. So um, we just started talking dates and how I was, you know, all, all the details of the thing. And, they, and I said, well, you know that, that my visa has expired. And uh, I stupidly said that because I never imagined that NBC Castle Rock wouldn't be able to secure a visa for me. Anyway, uh, as it turns out, um, there were rumors about why this happened, but they changed the rules around the H visa where uh, they tried to put as many roadblocks as possible into foreign foreigners getting American people's, American actors' jobs. Right. One of the ways they did it was to make the H visa uh, job specific. So if you went down to do a sign uh, Seinfeld with NBC, you could only then work for Seinfeld for the rest of the visa. The other right. one was you needed three weeks processing time. And there was no way around it. You absolutely oh. had to have this processing time to prove to this bureaucrat with all your awards and everything else. Even though your file was together, even though you had all the H visas before, they have to taft hartley you with whatever the hell they were doing to get you down there. Uh, yeah. And so I just started to scramble, and I did everything. I, um, I, I was a fax at the time. I faxed the, the Prime Minister of Canada. I faxed the Immigration Office. I faxed uh, Pearson um, Airport because they had a uh, American um, INS office there. I did absolutely everything, and Mark Hirschfeld said, "Look, we have we have to shoot this in a week and a half or two weeks or whatever it was. Yeah. We are going to have to cast it the week before on a Wednesday or whatever it was. I will call you personally on a Wednesday morning uh, before the casting session, see if you got it done." So I had literally hours to get this thing happening. And uh, I just I blew my brains out trying to do it. And he called and I said, I can't do it. I just can't do it. And um, it was partially my fault uh, that I said I didn't have a work visa. If I just left that out of the mix, it wouldn't have been a problem because uh, I had a social security number. It was everything was set. Right. Uh, the contract was there. I should have gone down. I should have shot the thing and then the paperwork would have come through when time came to write the check for the for the show. Right. I can't tell you how much I empathize with that story because like you, I always I mean, I don't want to miscategorize you if tell me if I am, but I have that maybe it's Canadian, I don't know, but that sort of compulsion to be very honest at all times, to have to lay the facts out on the table. Here's where, you know, and, and it, it just often to my own detriment because I'm often giving people information that they don't need. It's like when the cop pulls you over, they go, do you know why I stopped you? And I go, well, I don't know. It could be anything. The latch on the trunk is broken and I was speeding and I'm a little high, you know. <laughs> um, 
yeah, but I do you know what I mean? Like, and I I do sometimes yeah. wonder if that's a Canadian kind of overshare instinct. Sometimes, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's to a great extent we we play by the rules here much more than we do down there for sure. For sure. Yeah, I mean, we're, 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 we are rule followers as a as a nation. Yeah, absolutely, and and more socialists, you know, and and you know, there's there's good news and bad news about that. We have universal health care, and we have this, and we have that, but you know, we tend yeah. not to do other things like. You know, we don't um, we don't um, we don't value uh, personal success as much as they do in the states. We don't no. have as many heroes as Americans yeah. do. We, uh, you know, so and, uh, so it is what but, it is. Well, and, but all that and, said, I mean, look, here's a uh, let me let me give you a quote from this is your this is you speaking at BAMP. This is back in I think 2009. I want to work in a place where I want to live, and I don't want to live any place but this country. We take that for granted so much. I want to live in a place where I can actually trust the people I believe are my friends. I, I, I think part of that, the, that you, what you just read there, was the end of my story about um, the difference between Americans and Canadians. Did, did I ever tell you that story? No, go ahead. The 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 uh, people that did um, this just in. I mean, we did we did these episodes for CBS, and uh, it didn't get picked up for the fall. And I was down there. Uh, on this basis that they wanted to shoot these episodes and my wife was pregnant at the time and we were up down there and and the producers really embraced me like they they said you know your your wife's pregnant so i want you to go to the juvenile shop on ventura boulevard and i want you to tell them that this is i i mine you know tell them pat sent you and i want you to treat you right and you know i had flowers there and the, you know they they became my friends they really did become my friends and uh, I trusted them implicitly. And uh, whenever we, you know, during the shooting of the show, they say, so what's happening today? Are you, uh, are you, are you out there? Are you, you know, and I said, yeah, I'm going to audition for this and this and this. He said, because it wasn't an exclusive contract. And um, uh, they said, oh, great. Well, you know, say hi to Joe Blow for me. And I said, great. And so I go out and I audition and then they asked me how it went. And I said, fine, I didn't get it or I got it. Or, you know, it was, she was like, it was a very maternalistic kind of relationship. And uh, uh, when the show ended up not being picked up for the fall, I had a little um, clause in my contract that I would be paid a small amount of money, it's like $5,000 or something, to keep me exclusive to them uh, until the spring. In, in case it was a, a mid-season pickup. So December 1st rolls around and there's no money. And my agent says, well, I'll give him a call and I'll let you know. So he calls him and he calls me back and he says, well, Peter, uh, apparently what's happened is that um, you've been telling them that you've been going out for these auditions and uh, you've told them that you're not really close to anything. So they're not worried about losing you. So they're not going to be paying you the money. Mm. And I thought, my God, <laughs> I'm starting out here. My wife is pregnant. You you befriended me. Then you used the information that I gave you personally against me professionally. Right. And and so the end of the story is that whenever I tell this to a Canadian friend, they say, "My God, that's awful! That she just totally betrayed you using the information." And and whenever I tell that story to an American friend, they said, "Yeah, what are you fucking stupid? Yeah. Don't tell a producer." <laughs> So, and that that to me is like a quintessential story for you know the difference between there and here it's, it's yeah uh, i'm not i'm not naive enough to say it's not it doesn't happen here but it doesn't happen to that kind of you know bold face extent that it does down there it's a different yeah it is it's a, it's a different vibe and i you know and I, frankly i don't know that i ever totally cracked it i mean i i always felt like Certainly, in any writers' room I worked in down here, I always felt like the Canadian in the room, usually because they would make fun of me, um, and you know, just the accent and stuff. But also, just that slightly different nature of ours to be very not just self-deprecating but self-revelatory. I think in a way that Americans are maybe less fond of. Yeah, uh, that may be a huge. Yeah, don't don't give out any information you don't need to. Just like we were talking about, you know, just. Keep your cards close to your chest and uh, put your head down and move. That's right. I've I've always and then been again, and that's not that's not the way I wanted to live. I don't want to live in a country where I don't know who my friends are. Number one, your father-in-law Gordon Pinson started a 1976 Christmas-themed television film for CBC. What was the name of that film? 
Gift to last. Boom, a gift to last. Uh, favorite actor named Peter, who isn't you? Uh, Peter Stebbings. Peter who? <laughs> Stebbings, Canadian actor. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Sunday morning in the Peter Callahan, Leah Pinson home. What are you doing? Uh, we are having coffee and we're doing uh, a, uh, there's a Toronto Star quiz. And it's, it's, Flossie. It's, it's a it's a uh, it's kind of like a, a trivia questionnaire that's new every weekend on Sunday papers, and oh, then nice. it's always tradition. Yeah, then it's always tradition to watch uh, Sunday morning on CBS. Oh, nice. Okay, which is a fabulous show if you haven't watched it. And I've been trying now for sixteen years to do a similar show in Canada. Is that like a Sunday morning show? Does that appeal to you? Current events? Yeah, it's kind of like, it's like a Sunday morning show, and it's I want to call it. Um, Sunday at home, and it's uh, it's a news magazine show that um, picks from all the sort of best good news stories from across Canada. You know, helping Ukrainian immigrants, and you know what Rick Mercer does at his Newfoundland retreat, and where David Suzuki gets his pot, and all kinds of stuff. Favorite member of the Rat Pack? No question, Martin. Also, Brent Butts. I've been, I've been a huge I've been a huge Dean Martin fan most of my life. You make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for yourself. What flavor is the jam or jelly? Strawberry. Number 13, what actor are you most often mistaken for? Uh, not an actor, uh, a personality, Dr. Oz. Oh, you're kidding. I get, I get mistaken for Dr. You do, Oz. I guess you time. do look a little bit like Dr. Oz. I, never I, don't, thought of that. I don't get it. My mother, my mother thinks I do. Uh, I, I've actually been stopped at an American airport so many times. Asking me if I'm Dr. Oz. First band you saw in concert, number 14. We're almost done. Uh, George Harrison. Oh, that's a good one. Hi, childhood movie star crush. Uh, uh, Julie Andrews. Interesting. I love Julie Andrews. I, I, I so wanted to marry Julie Andrews after Mary Poppins. I thought this is it. There's somehow, some way I got to meet her. I don't know how old I was, five or seven. I would meet her and I would marry her. I had that, when I was five or seven, I had that with Marie Osmond. Really? Both of them were, well, Marie was, I met Marie once actually, and coincidentally, uh, she was doing Sound of Music in uh, San Francisco. I met her backstage in San Francisco once. Yeah. I turned your Julie Andrews story into my Marie Osmond story. Into your Marie Osmond. Pull out the connection. Um, number 17, your beloved and lovely and talented wife, Leah, starred in a 1986 cult horror film. Uh, I, I know you probably know the name of it. A April Fool's Day? Do you know this? You know April this. Fool's Day, April yes. April Fool's yes, Day. Yes. Alongside a cast yeah. that included a cast member who, would, who, who had uh, appeared in Back to the Future the prior year. Do you know who that was? Oh, crap. Yeah, uh, the bully on Back to the Future. That's right. Very funny guy whenever I see him in interviews. You don't see him a lot. Thomas F. Yeah, Wilson. I... Uh, role you would have most liked to play? Uh, a cowboy in a Western or a, 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 a pilot in World War II. Have you never played like a real Western role yet? That surprises me. No. I feel like you would no. be, don't take this the wrong way. I feel like you would be a good Western villain. Yeah, I, I, I think I would be too. Yeah. 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 A really, a really um, um, duplicitous, nice guy on the outside, but a piece of shit on the inside. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. That would be, that would, that would be fun. Eh? You, you haven't, have you played a lot of straight villains? I guess you played uh, some villains in your time. I played, I played villains. Yeah, mostly, mostly sort of moneyed assholes. Uh, I'm going to be playing uh, uh, a pedophile wife beater um, this fall. <laughs> oh, but that's that's about as bad as I ever got. I think. Yeah. Or, well, that's okay. Yeah. That checks a couple of boxes in the in the uh, in yeah. the villain. Uh. <laughs> um, Peter, that's it. We survived. You survived. We made it. I uh, I can't. Uh, any questions? 
I have no questions. Uh, I wish I had as good a questions as you had for me. Uh, well, I, I, I do my best, but I, it is, uh, you know, part of the reason I, I, I wanted to just do this for, for no real reason at all, other than, uh, to do it and to get a, a kind of a chance and excuse to, to talk to folks that I haven't, that I don't get to see a lot or I haven't spoken to in a while. And this, this, yeah, well, this is, we're, we're looking forward to you back here, my friend. Well, I, we I'm like you here. I'm sorry. We need people like you back oh, here. Oh, God, I, I wanted to make you say that twice. Thank you. Um, no, God bless you. Thank you very much for saying that. But Peter Callahan is wrapped. Thank you very much, Peter. Thanks, Rob. Take care of yourself.